uh, give me one second, please. So, uh, are we starting now or? or yeah, we are minutes? starting now. You can stay quiet. In the meantime, okay. we'll introduce you. Just, I just got to get the electrician at the door. One second. Uh, Fifteen seconds. No, no problem. Yeah, we are starting now. You can stay quiet. In the meantime, we'll introduce you. Just, I just got. Yeah, no video on. Yes. Uh, we are live now. Uh, today we have. Uh, today we. Today we have a dynamic hip and knee surgeon from Harbour City Orthopedics, from all the way from New South Wales, Australia. He is Dr. Sol Khureshi, and to introduce him, I hand over to Dr. Gaurav Kanadi. Dr. Gaurav, can you introduce him? Okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone in India, and good evening in Australia. So we have with us Dr. Sol Kureshi. Uh, he's from Australia. Uh, Harbour City Host uh, Hospital is the name of his hospital. So, so today we'll be discussing about an other panelist, uh, Dr. Sanjay Dar. He's from India, the Joint Replacement Surgeon from India. Uh, the today the we'll be discussing the unique technique of. Uh, hip replacement, which is the super part technique, as he calls it, uh, wherein he don't cut the any extend rotators. So we'll be looking forward for the webinar. So over to you, Dr. Saul Kureshi. Uh, great. Um, so thank you, everyone, for for joining in. Um, um, uh, I'd like to start by uh, thanking uh, Author TV for. Uh, hosting uh, this talk and uh, special thanks to Dr. Kanare and Dr. Thar for having me on and being the panelist. Uh, namaskar to all of you and Namaskar Mara to you. Um, these two uh, people I've had the pleasure of working with. Uh, Dr. Parth Agawal was our fellow a couple of years ago and Dr. Supreet Bajwa is our current fellow. Um, and I was mentioning to you before, do, do not be fooled by their gentle and uh, youthful looks. These people are mean machines and tanks. Both of them can uh, easily eat three people's lunch in about seven minutes uh, and they won't even burp. Uh, so Parth, thank you for, for putting together this, um, this talk and inviting me. Um, now, <clears throat> I, I just wasn't sure about the, the format of this, so please feel free to, to, to suggest an alternative format, but I thought I'd do a short PowerPoint presentation about the concept of the technique, um, followed by a uh, animation video, which most of you probably are familiar with anyway, and then a, a video of uh, a camera in my, in my uh, helmet, so you can see what I see. Um, and then I might show you a couple of x-rays, uh, a couple of patient videos, and what we normally do with everyone. Um, and then if you guys have questions, uh, we can, we can uh, make it into an interactive session. Uh, does that sound okay, Dr. Dar, Dr. Kanade? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, all right, sounds good. So here we go. Um, I, I, I'm sure you guys have heard a lot about Superpath over the years. Uh, um, I've been in India, presented at APAS uh, on, a, on a few occasions. Um, I've uh, operated in Hyderabad, uh, done two of these cases. Uh, and there's been a lot of hype, obviously. You know, the technique, uh, the technique, uh, was originally described by uh, the Americans in 2006. It was actually a, a fusion of two pre-existing techniques. There's nothing super about it. That's exactly what I tell the patients. Uh, there's nothing super about it. It's just another way of doing a hip replacement whereby with the help of certain instruments, I am able to preserve muscles and ligaments uh, to the max. I don't not cut muscles. I'm sure this one gets a bit of a tear. This one gets a bit of a tickle. Sometimes the piriformis tears, sometimes you get a bit. But overall, the preservation that I'm able to achieve of the rotators, the RTB, the, the ligamentous envelope of the hip is unparalleled. This is not my opinion. This is fact. The preservation you get, it, it's the least preserving technique there is in, in regards to the soft tissue envelope. Um, so I went and learned this technique from the... Uh, the, uh, the, the innovator surgeon, the designer surgeon, Jimmy Chow. I uh, also saw another colleague of ours, Harbinder Chada in uh, San Diego, who was also one of the initial surgeons. Um, and then I sort of, 
initially, like everyone else, I was a bit skeptical. And then I, uh, the people that invited me, I thought, look, I'm, I'm going to come over there. I'm going to have a look at it. But I don't promise I'm going to start doing it because who knows, you know, they're always trying to sell you something. When I went over there, I looked at the cadavers. Then I looked at the them doing it on, on patients, uh, assisted in a couple of operations. This is, this in principle, this is good. It can be done. So then I started doing it on my uh, uh, patients, on my, uh, in my, in my uh, practice. And um, surely, but uh, surely like with, with a few of them, I started doing a bit more preservation, a bit more preservation, and I started noticing the results. Um, and then I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to give it a good go. And uh, now we've done about a thousand and that was uh, six, seven years ago. Um, and I've been pretty happy with it. So I'm going to hopefully share with you some of my, my experiences. Um, every time a new technique comes along, may that be direct anterior, super path, and I'm sure the posterior guys had this problem when everyone was doing direct uh, lateral, you know, 20, 30 years ago. But the concept here is preservation. Um, and if you maintain or restore uh, the function of an anatomical structure, uh, the aim is that it will reduce morbidity and hopefully it'll have some re uh, implications in terms of results or somehow it'll uh, uh, influence results. Uh, so it's the same concept of evolution, trying to get better at what we're doing and hopefully get a better result. Um, and people say that, uh, you know, well, if it's working fine, why do you have to change it? Why do you need to change the technique if the, what we're doing is fine? Or why do you need to change the implant if what we're doing is fine? But you know what? That's probably what Dr. Girdleston thought when he was presented with the concept of having a hip replacement. I thought, well, I can just take the femoral head out and my patient can walk seven miles without a hip. Why do you need to put in a piece of metal there? Uh, but the wheel keeps turning and, you know, here we are. Um, initially, they did a hip replacement with a fairly invasive method, uh, you know, mutilating to the abductors, uh, taking the trochanters off, and then direct lateral became a bit more fashionable. Then Larry Dorr modified that, taking a slither of bone uh, with a modified direct lateral. Um, then posterior came along and here we are in 2020. Posterior is still the the workhorse, uh, probably the most common tested and trial technique, and very, very good technique. Um, but we know that they have their, their shortcomings and, and the concept of MIS has been around for a long time. It's not recent, it's not with direct anterior or super path. We know that uh, the, the concept is you, you cut less, therefore there's less trauma, less inflammatory response. So hopefully it has uh, an effect on uh, recovery parameters such as blood loss, post-operative pain, stability, et cetera, um, which may allow you to do early mobilization, which obviously has its own benefits and earlier discharge, which has a benefit not just on the patient, but also on the economic side of things and hopefully a quicker return to function. MIS concept date back to what Nabi, you know, make a small cut, see if we can do something keyhole. In hip replacements, uh, I guess VL and Skulko were probably the, the, the pioneers of the mini posterior approach. Um, and uh, a lot of people still do it with the uh, piriformis preservation, et cetera. Um, then Verger came along with a minimally invasive two incision technique. So, you know, part of the incision was posterior approach and part of it was a uh, direct lateral or sort of anterior approach into the joint. Um, and with these ones, the mini posterior and mini invasive, the, the emphasis was somewhat on a mini incision. They were focused on the incision. What happened inside was not as, I guess, as much um, emphasis was not placed on it. So you could do maximally invasive inside, but you just get in through a smaller hole. Then Stephen Murphy uh, uh, in uh, the States came up with this technique called super cap, where, where is still the posterior approach, but he went between gluteus minimus and uh, piriformis and uh, with an offset remade, tried to preserve the, the uh, rotators and, and uh, compare the acetabulum with the offset remote. But obviously it's a bit uh, technically tedious because as you know, the offset remotes have a big shaft that gets in the way, it might uh, obscure your vision. At the same time, when Murphy was working on supercap, Brad Pennenberg uh, on the other side of America was working on his technique called PART, as in percutaneous assisted total hip. So he was doing like a posterior approach, but to do the acetabular part, he was putting a cannula in uh, and then leaving it like a shoulder, you know, uh, cannula that you use, you, and then you do the acetabular ring through that. And more recently, and when I say recently, in the last five, seven years, um, strikes, Strike has been pushing the direct superior approach and um, Rogers came up with that, uh, and that's very similar to Murphy's super cap, 
because they use an offset trimmer, but they're not so big on preservation of the posterior rotators because they let go of the conjoint tendon and everything, etc. And as we've all heard of the direct anterior approach, and particularly in Australia, in the last sort of 13, 14 years, it's been pushed very, very heavily um, to the point where I'm, I'm sure something similar might have happened in India and a lot of other parts of the world. There's been a lot of um, a lot of resistance to that. So there's a few surgeons starting it off for whatever reason, uh, may the motivations be uh, results or commercial motivation. But anyway, they pushed it through, a lot of resistance initially, and then the resistance died down. And now a lot of surgeons sort of have to get on the bandwagon because otherwise they're losing patients. Um, minimally invasive surgery, is it real or is it really just all marketing? Is it driven by commercial factors? And uh, the critics of minimally invasive surgery or minimally invasive hip and surgery say it's, 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 it's a, bit like, a bit like this guy. You know, he's old and frail and he's lifting this big tree, but when you get close, it's an empty, um, empty hype. So direct anterior actually uh, caused a lot of this uh, where there was a lot of marketing hype but then a lot of people started taking it up without really having appropriate training. So there was a lot of complications. Um, but ultimately we're living in, in, a, in a world of the internet and uh, patients are a lot more um, aware, they're uh, researching things and they want to get what they've seen on TV or they want to get what they've seen uh, as being the minimally invasive. Um, so here certainly, and I'm sure in other parts of the world, patients come asking for a certain technique, which obviously 15 years ago was unheard of. When you actually look at the evidence, and I'm not going to talk about anterior too much, but when you look about the evidence for minimally invasive surgery, particularly posterior, there's plenty of evidence now to show that it's safe and reproducible in the right hands. And I think that's the key word, as long as it's done well. There's studies showing a lower blood loss. There's studies showing faster recovery functionally. There's studies showing improved peri or op, uh, pain control, shorter length of stay, et cetera. Um, and you can really, if you want to dissect those studies, there's some good studies. There's some pretty average studies. There's some pretty poor studies. But initially, there were some studies that showed an increased complication profile. And again, they're not exactly good studies either. But you know, you, you hear about some complications, makes you, it sensitizes you a little bit, and often people get on... Um, people get uh, a bit weary and, and uh, that sort of, you know, discourages them. But there's certainly inconsistency in the literature. But if you look at all these studies uh, in support of minimally invasive hip replacement surgery, and I'm talking about superpath, I'm talking about MIS, two incision technique, mini incision technique, whatever. But some of them are actually level one randomized control trials or meta-analyses. So it's close to getting level one evidence in some centers. Obviously there'll be resistance to change because people are used to doing it a certain way. So they wouldn't want to change. Um, and uh, people that do change, they might have other motivations. They might be wanting to build their practice. They might be uh, really seeing something good in a, in, a, in a technique. And I think, okay, I really want to do this for my patients. I want to get better results if they truly believe in it. Um, people that are resistant might say, well, look, you know, if I had changed my technique, then I'll have a learning curve and I'll probably have a few complications and that won't be good for my patient. That won't be good for my practice. So that will be a resistance. And I experienced all of those things with Superpath initially, you know, a lot of criticism, a lot of scrutiny. And the main critics, even now, are still people who've never seen or never done one. And whenever I get visitors coming to, to my theaters and they see it, the most common comment I get is, hey, I, I didn't really think you could see this much. So that the critics didn't believe it until they see it. And obviously orthopedic surgeons, we do have uh, some egos as well. Sometimes people just don't wanna see it. So getting back to superpart now, uh, the way I see superpart, I think it's a balance between micro, they call it microinvasive. Obviously no one uses the microscope to use it, but they see it's a, it's a balance between minimally invasive concepts all the way to maximally invasive. And the reason I say that is, because you can either do a super path case and completely preserve all the soft tissue envelope. Um, and you can obviously release a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more until you've converted it to a full posterior approach. So, um, you know, you can, you can do it at your level of comfort. You can be as maximally or minimally invasive. The salvage option is very easy. 
so it makes it a very uh, dynamic and versatile. You're not really committed. It's not like you do an anterior and suddenly you've got a complication, you've got a problem with positioning or you've got a problem with exposure or you've got a problem with femoral uh, preparation. You go stuff this, I'm gonna close it, you turn the patient around and do a posterior. You don't have to do that. All you've got to do with superpath is you make the incision a little bit longer and a little bit longer and a little bit longer if you need to. You know, you, you're you not happy, you cut the piriformis. You're not happy, you cut the gemella. You're not happy, you cut the obturator. You cut the quadratus or you cut the ITB as well and then you've got a posterior approach. So you're not really stuck anywhere where you can't, and you don't have a fallback option. So people that start off, I tell them to you know, learn it at your own pace. You don't have to preserve everything on your first case. Start small, but if you need to release a bit more until you are happy that you've seen everything, you are happy you don't have a fracture, you are happy that your position is good and your, your uh, uh, construct is uh, how it should be. Um, because really this concept of a learning curve is only about 10, 15 years old. Before that, I'd never heard of the term learning curve. And it's a very dangerous concept because it, it almost justifies or gives credibility to, to us learning at someone else's expense. You know, we might be learning, but someone else is losing their leg or someone else is having a life-changing complication. That's not good. We are harming people. So it really should be called a harm curve because you're not really doing anyone any favors in that time. Um, with superpath, I don't think there is a learning curve because... I mean, there's a learning curve. If you want to quickly do this operation in half an hour, you probably will cut or break something you know you shouldn't. But if you take your time, you, there, there shouldn't be a, uh, a, uh, a, a complication associated with a foreign concept or a foreign technique. Um, okay, so now getting to the technicality of it. It's an acronym, as you know, supracapsular. So we're, we're preserving the posterior ligament, anterior ligament, and inferior ligament. You're approaching it from the confluence between the iliofemoral and the ilioistial ligament. So it's at the top of the capsule. Percut that's how you approach the, the joint. And then percutaneous assisted because you insert a cannula for, femoral uh, for uh, acetabular preparation. Um, I think I would, I would be comfortable calling it as a modification of the posterior approach. And it's a hybrid between two previously existing techniques, as I mentioned in the first couple of slides. And this, this slide is a bit old, sorry. I think it's, it's been around for about more like 15 years now, uh, not 10 years. It is transgluteal. So what you do is you, you split the fibers of gluteus maximus with your fingers. You don't actually transversely cut them. Um, in fact, I just cut the fascia and then I separate them with my fingers. Um, and it aims to preserve the ITB. We, we don't touch the ITB. We don't touch the external rotators. You know, piriformis may get a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a tear, or might stretch a little bit. Or and sometimes you might decide to release it and repair it. Um, it will preserve all the other posterior external rotators. It'll preserve all the inferior, anterior, and posterior ligament. I've never, as in in the last thousand hips, zero times have to do a, an anterior release or an anterior capsulectomy or capsulotomy. I don't know why. And we don't surgically dislocate the head. So obviously you take the head out, um, but because everything is intact, you can't actually just rotate the hip and pop the head out. So you either get it out, if there's enough uh, laxity in the, in the soft tissue on you can get the head out in one piece, or I often sort of break it into a couple of pieces and get it out. And it's not implant specific. I have cemented in Exodus through this. I have done a Zweimuller type stem in with this. Um, so, you, you know, you, you can pretty much do uh, within the constraints of what's available, you can use any implant. Uh, obviously, the, the right medical or microport are pretty clever people. They uh, patented the technique, so you can only use their instruments if you have uh, if you use their implant. But I've been using it for the last seven years, and I've been pretty happy with it actually. Um, okay, so why don't we now go to? I'm going to show you a, an animation first. Um, we won't uh, take too long with that one. And then once we've gone through that, we'll go through the, uh, uh, okay. Let me know if you guys, if, if, uh, if this is not projecting well. All right, so in terms of uh, patient positioning, it's, it's positioned like a, like a posterior approach, lateral decubitus position. We don't use the brackets to, uh, on the front and back of the patient. We have these thing called a peg table. It's just like a little sheet that goes on top of your normal table and then jelly on top of it. And we just put a post front and back and another one uh, front and back of the chest. So uh, positioning wise, and you can use the brace as well, the normal posterior approach brace that you use as well if you, if you want. Um, landmarks are your greater trochanter, 
So front and back of the greater trochanter. It's like the posterior approach uh, incision, but probably just the top half of it. Once you uh, do that, I get to glute max fascia. I just cut the glute max fascia with my fingers or diathermic. Glute max, you separate with your fingers. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> you've got half of glute max anteriorly and posteriorly. Then you're looking at gluteus medius. That's the posterior border of gluteum medius. And then you've got the rotators there. You've got piriformis and et cetera, et cetera. So you move the gluteus uh, medius uh, anteriorly. Sorry, Dr. Saul Qureshi, can you full screen it? It'll look better. Full screen it? Okay. Yeah. okay. How's that? Yes, this is better. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, how do I play it now? Okay, so there's medius rotated anteriorly, rotators uh, move posteriorly. So then that brings into view your capsule. This is, this is the top of the capsule. You can see that you can feel the femoral head through it. And you often place these homans as you cut the capsule with a straight line, there's no H or U or uh, just a straight incision going from medial all the way to lateral to the piriform fossa. And that will get you into the hip joint. So then you're pretty much looking at the top of the femoral neck. You put your homens at front and back of the neck. Sorry. So you put your homens at the back of the neck and the front of the neck, and then you're pretty much looking at the femoral neck and the piriform fossa. And that's where you open the piriform fossa for femoral preparation. Normally you use a small drill first, then a guide wire, then a bigger reamer to open it up. Once you've done that, then you use a box osteotomy to cut out a little channel. Once you've done that, you're pretty much looking at the femoral shaft directly. And you put your brooch, you do a bit of curating, make sure you don't have any ridges, etc. You can make this hole a bit bigger if you need to. Then you've got the brooch. Now brooch has an inline brooch handle. You can use a one that comes out the side of the wall. You might have to make a slightly bigger box cut. And you're looking straight down the canal. So you, you brooch it, tuck, 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 until you get to the size you want. Um, now the common question here is uh, what happens, uh, how do you work out where the, the femoral stem is sitting? Because when you do a posterior approach, you've made the neck cut and you've got about a fin finger's breadth above the lesser trope or that's your landmark or greater trochanter is your landmark. What's your landmark here? Well, there's plenty of landmarks. You can't actually feel the greater trochanter because there's muscle on top of it. You can't see it either. You might be able to sort of feel a bone prominence. You obviously can't see the lesser trochanter because that's way below and your neck is intact. So the, the common landmarks, the brooch handle has a marking on it. It's got a ruler on it. That's one thing. But the most reliable one is the saddle, the top of the neck. Uh, can you see my mouse arrow move? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's the, that's, the, that's the anterior part of the saddle. You'll see it here as well when you're looking at it. You'll see the top of the saddle. Now, that is a landmark that you can identify uh, intraoperatively. And obviously, you've identified that on your x-rays when you've templated as well. So that's usually a pretty good indicator. Um, what I also do, once I've gotten to the stem size that I'm happy with, then I also get a quick x-ray shot as well, just to make sure that I've got a nice tight fill. I know where the stem is. But obviously, I don't know how tight the fill is. And that, that II image sort of gives me a lot of reassurance that it's not likely to subside. So the brooch, then you leave the brooch in. So there's your brooch that's of your desired size in. You leave that in. And you use that as an intramedullary guide to neck resection. So you'll put the saw here on top of the brooch. And you'll cut the front, the back, and the medial calcar. And that's your neck osteotomy, like so. And I think uh, I'll hopefully be able to demonstrate better in the technical, uh, in, the, in the real video. So once you've done the neck osteotomy, uh, you take the head out and the, in the cartoon, it comes out much easier than it comes out in real life. I normally break it up into a few pieces and it, it comes out that way. Uh, once the head is out, now you're looking at the acetabulum. So through that main incision, you cut the labrum, you get out all the pulvinar or the, you know, the soft tissue at the bottom of the horseshoe uh, or the floor to expose your acetabulum. I often infiltrate a bit of local anesthetic at this stage as well. Once you've done that, now you're ready for the femoral reaming. Now, this is the part that scared me and scared most orthopedic surgeons when they first look at it. You have to insert a cannula because you can't ream through this main incision. You, you basically, the reamer shaft comes in posteriorly to the femur and aims into the acetabulum. And you have a little jig. Uh, it's like an ACL jig, you know, targeting jig. It's got 
it's got a whole cannula here, so you put in a, a blood trocar through it and it lands in the center of the acetabulum. You don't have to use the jig. Essentially, you aim for the cannula to come into the joint just posterior to the femoral calcar. And that will give you plenty of uh, independence and agility and movement. So you do this, this is a blunt trocar. You make a little incision, it goes in and it comes into the acetabulum. You take the jig out, uh, you put the femoral reamer through there, shaft of the can, um, uh, reamer through there, uh, through the cannula, and you ream to the desired side. Once you've done that, you put in the cup through the main incision. Uh, it's very, very easy to put screws in. In fact, it's a lot quicker putting screws into the cup through this technique than it is with the posterior approach. Uh, you just put in the, uh, the drill and the um, drill guide through the cannula and literally it takes about 30 seconds. You don't have to fiddle with the angled holder that keeps on slipping when you put it in or anything like that. So I always put screws in more for peace of mind, but you often get a very nice and solid rim capture uh, cup. Um, in terms of cup positioning, you see all the landmarks very, very easily. The TAL, the anterior, superior, posterior, uh, wall, inferior, the whole acetabulum pretty much. Um, you've impacted the cup in. Once you do that, then I do the trial. So the neck of the femoral trial goes into the brooch. We put in the trial liner into the cup and then we, the head goes in and then we do what's called an in-situ reduction. That is putting the head in, then trying to relocate the neck into the head. The reason we do that is because if you preserved all that soft tissue envelope, you can't actually put the head in and rotate it back in. It doesn't allow you. Um, and for the same very reason, you know, if you can relocate something, you can dislocate it the same way. So, what, but once you put the head in and then traction it, try to get the neck into it and it engages into the taper, uh, it's supposed to create a, a, almost a, a non-dislocatable construct. I'm not sure if you can push hard enough, you can dislocate it, but we test it pretty vigorously on the table. And the aim is that this should not dislocate in this patient's functional range. Um, and you, you, know, you look for impingement and usual stuff that you, you look for in stability testing. And I'll show you a video of what we normally do for every patient for uh, stability testing. And once you've done that, you put the real thing the uh, same way. Uh, and then you close the capsule with a running suture. Uh, these, they, in this situation, they've repaired the piriformis because they took it off. I, I don't take it off um, very, very rarely. If I do, I'll repair it, but otherwise we don't have to repair it. Basically just the capsule closure and then uh, gluteus maximus fascia closure, fat skin, and that's it. Um, so are we going okay? You still with me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think what we'll do now is we'll move on to the, the uh, video. Um, Sorry, I've just got a one and a half year old visitor. Hi, Ryan. Sorry, guys. Mommy, can you take Ryan back to the room, please? Okay. All right. So here we go. Um, and what I've done is I've um, sometimes you can't the camera on on my helmet doesn't project all the way into it. So I've used a I've used a, uh, an arthroscope and I've put it in there to, to show you uh, like a, a window on the side. Okay, so I'll stop every now and then. There's my skin incision. Probably a little bit bigger than usual. There's the glute, fa uh, glute max fascia. It's gluteus medius, gluteus maximus uh, being split by fingers. Then they lift the knee, take the tension off it. Then I enter, they see that, um, let me show you that. Okay, I don't know if you just made out, there was a yellow fat in the middle. That's your, that's your intergluteal bursa. That's usually at the posterior margin of the gluteus medius. So you put in a homen, the anterior half of gluteus maximus, put in a, a self-retainer retractor or a Langenbach retractor, posterior half of gluteus maximus. Now I'm putting my finger in under medius. Same interval that you use in the posterior approach to retract it anteriorly, so between Minimus and medius. So I'll put a, a Langen back there, take the homen out. Now I've retracted medius anteriorly. So now I'm looking at, pause. I'm looking at piriformis and minimus. So piriformis, minimus, usually piriformis goes underneath, uh, sorry, minimus goes underneath piriformis a little bit. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna cut this fascia a little bit just to allow me to mobilize my minimus. And once I've done that, 
I'm going to try and sweep that minimus anteriorly and piriformis posteriorly a little bit. And you can see the capsule underneath it, that white structure is the posterior superior capsule. So I'll, I'll hold that minimus anteriorly with a Langen back. Then I'll, uh, I'm introducing my cob between the, the piriformis and the capsule, or all the rotators in the capsule. And then I put a Hohmann separating the rotators and the posterior ligament. And this is, um, now just a quick question, guys. Um, I can see my image and Dr. Kanadi's image and, and a row of images. Is that obscuring that video at all or not? No, it's not obscuring. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay, I'll just go to full screen. That might be easier. Okay, so uh, then you're looking at the top of the capsule. So you cut the capsule like that with a long diathermy tip all the way to the, the, the back. Okay, now I'm looking at the, the top of the femoral neck. Expose it a little bit more. So now we're, we'll change the position. We'll put these homans just with a cob. I'm lifting up the capsule. I'm gonna put the homan anterior to the femoral neck. And in the same way, the posterior homan, I'll take it out from uh, between the ligament and the rotator, then I'll put it inside the ligament. Put it just posterior to the femoral neck. Now both the homans are intra-articular, front and back of the femoral neck. Then I'll create with a drill uh, uh, an opening into the top of the femoral canal. Um, once I've done that, I'm gonna check with the guide wire to make sure I'm in. Uh, I have on a couple of occasions come out of the side uh, and we've had to rectify it, nothing too major. You just dilate that hole a bit more with a bigger reamer, like a gamma nail reamer. And then I'm looking at the, the canal. So with my box chisel, I'm gonna cut out a little uh, little hole into the femoral head. And that's the view I get. So here I'm uh, looking at the femoral canal in there. That's the front of the femoral neck, that's the back. So that's my saddle. That's, that's something I can see on the X-ray as well, my pre-op templating. Uh, that's as well, but this is the most prominent one. This is the one you see uh, on the X-ray. I've cut out a little channel here and there's my femoral canal straight down. Can everyone see that? So there's your- Yes, yes, we can see it. Yes, yeah. we can see it. Okay. So through that, I start broaching, tap, 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 until I get to whatever I decide to do. So let's just say we've templated a size five or something like that. So can you close that please? Yes, you can. Sorry. So um, the, the brooch is in, uh, say size five. Uh, if I get the feel that I've, I'm at the right size, once I get that brooch in, I'll get an x-ray at this point. I haven't done the neck osteotomy and, and the x-ray will show me that I'm, oh, look, I think I can go a bigger size or, or hey, you know, uh, this is not going to subside. It's got cortical purchase, so I don't need to do anything further. Um, so after I've done that, yeah, so that's, that diathem is just showing my femoral neck anteriorly and posteriorly. And so it's very easy to get the II. You just put the IIC arm over the top. We'll put a couple of plastics on, on the hip. One, two, one or two shots and that's it. And there you go. That looks like it's a bit, it's, it's where I want it to be, but I think I could probably go to a bigger stem because there's a bit of, space here and if I leave that one it might subside so I go okay well my x-ray pre-op might have been a bit uh, you know the magnification might have been wrong I'll go to a slightly bigger size until I've got cortical purchase mm. um, so that helped me in that regard so I I, uh, I go to the um, the size that I've templated but then I get an x-ray just to make sure that that is correct and in this situation that wasn't correct I could have gone to a bigger size so once I'm happy with the size, I put the saw, and you may notice with this is a reset saw, but I put a bit of Cumfield tape around there. So the, the blade goes all the way top to bottom. So I put that tape around there so it doesn't damage the back of medius or minimus or piriformis. Um, so I put the, put the saw in in front of the brooch, like so. I usually put a sucker in front of it so I can see. And I cut the back, front, and then the saw just sort of slides in medially as well. You're in the joint, uh, as long as you don't push it in too far, you're, you're pretty much safe, there's nothing there. And there's homans in front of and back of the femoral neck. Uh, so they're, they're protecting uh, everything else. So that, that being done, uh, 
to, to make it easier for me to get the head out. Uh, I was always, I was a bit worried in the first couple of years, why doesn't my head come out as easily as it does in the animation? So now I just take out a little wedge that gives me a bit more maneuverability. Uh, uh, and uh, the head comes out in a few pieces. It's, it makes life a lot easier. Um, so once the head, that's the wedge, and then you, you drill these pins into the head, you get a good bite of the head and the head usually comes out like so. Now, I'm just gonna check to make sure I haven't destroyed anything. That's the anterior leaf of the capsule. That's the posterior leaf of the capsule. There's my intact piriform. There's just the posterior superior astabular wall, post, uh, posterior wall, and there's my astabulum in through there. So uh, what I'm doing here is just confirming that I'm all right, and it looks like I'm okay. There's the posterior capsular leaf and anterior capsular leaf in front of it. So now we put in a little gelpie retractors uh, inside there, like a self-retainer uh, to hold the leaves of the capsule, and then a homen. Now I put this homen here between the anterior superior capsule and the labrum. So you can see that's one o'clock, 12 o'clock, uh, 11 o'clock. That's di directly anterior wall, the anterior superior wall. And you can take the labrum out very, very comfortably. Um, like so, and you just basically put the knife on the inside of the acetabulum and it guides you and it comes out as a large piece. Um, the, the tip of my knife there is at, on, at 12 o'clock now. And I'm just putting a little bit of traction on my cocker here uh, and it basically just peels off very nicely. So if you look at that view, for example, you can pretty much see all the acetabulum directly except for the inside of the posterior superior part. But you can very easily put your finger in here and, and feel it after you've reamed it to make sure that you've got adequate uh, bleeding bone, et cetera. So that's the only part you don't see directly. But I, I usually expose a little bit of the posterior superior wall to give me an idea to make sure that I haven't reamed it out or how thick it is or how thin it is to allow me to, to preserve it. The other thing it does is that if when you're impacting the cup, you get a little slit in it or something, I'm sure I've cracked a lot of acetabuli in the posterior approach to what I used to do, but here I will know about it. And if I know about it, at least I can modify their weight bearing status, et cetera, because unlike posterior approach, we get them up weight bearers tolerated two, three hours later. Okay, so here I'm putting the homen inferiorly, and uh, I don't know if you can make it out, but in front of that homen, you, you can see that, okay, here's the posterior wall rather. And again, take out the labrum posterior inferiorly now. There's an osteophyte there as well. If it bothers you, you can knock it off now, like I am there with the osteotome. And the TAL is, sorry. There's the, there's the floor of my acetabulum there that I've diathermied. There's the TAL. And that's the sort of view you get. Once you've done that, this is a targeting device. You can use that or you don't have to use it. If you, I mean, I, a lot of times I don't use the the femoral head. Now you put the cannula sort of posteriorly. Remember, looking at that, you think, oh, shit, that's pretty close to the nerve. But when it goes in, it's at the level of the nerve. But by the time it gets to the femur, at the level of the nerve, it's actually right next to the femur. And the, the trocar is blunt. Now, I don't know what, what the literature rates for sciatic nerve injury in a posterior approach hip replacement is. But for the last thousand hips, I've been very lucky. I haven't had a single uh, sciatic nerve injury. So. Uh, I think we're doing all right. Mm. So there's your, just in the skin, you put the, put the blunt trocar in. And as you can see on the top right, it's coming out right next to the, the cow. You can, the, you can see the brooch there, femoral brooch and the cow cow, and it comes out right posterior to it. So there, that's right, there you go. There's the femoral cow cow and the, cow, the cannula comes out right next to it. So once that's in, you start putting in the reamers uh, until you're happy with the size you've got. And that's done under direct vision. So you can see the posterior wall completely. You can see how far you're going. You can see how much you've got left. Once you're happy with the whatever you've reamed, you put in the definitive cup. Now it's very handy because 
the, uh, the definitive cup, cup has this very narrow, uh, sort of slim cup holder. So you can actually vary the version pretty quickly. You're not fighting the femur. Uh, I put a little mark on it so that I can line up the screws where uh, superiorly so it doesn't, and I don't put the holes in the wrong position. So tap, tap, tap. I'm controlling the, the cup. Uh, often the fellows are uh, tapping very gently. And here's the cup that's down. It's 12 o'clock. So the top of the cup is lining up with the source sill. There's the anterior wall. And there's a posterior superior wall. Cup is a little proud. So I've got a nice amount of antiversion. Uh, I'm happy with that. Um, and if you look inferiorly, hopefully this video will show a bit of inferior stuff. It's actually playing off a hard drive, so it might speed up sometimes and slow down sometimes. I apologize for that. It's quite a bit, nine gigabytes, this video. There's the TAL. So, so we can see that the cup is parallel to the TAL. This is how we put screws in, the drill guide into the hole. Drill's got measurements. One antra superior 15 millimeter screw. One direct superiorly or slightly posterior superiorly 20 millimeter screw. Once the screws are in, I put the trial liners. In this situation, I put in a definitive liner. Now you might notice it's a lip liner and uh, I actually don't need lips for stability but uh, the story is that one day the rep opened a lip liner by accident and I didn't know where to, I didn't want to waste it. So I thought well if I put it inferiorly normally there's a bit of bone uh, shelf proud anyway so I don't think it's going to cause me any impingement and I did that but it got me thinking uh, and then a few months after that, me and uh, Bill Walsh, who's a professor of research in a hospital nearby, we did a CT-based study, study looking at positioning of lip liners. And we found that if you position it inferiorly, it's not really going to cause you any problem with your primary arc, except for in adduction. But to reach the amount of adduction before impingement happens is not going to be possible because your other leg will always be in the way. Um, and it will give you slightly more abduction. Um, so I routinely put in lip liners uh, for that reason, but we don't need to for stability. So there's pretty, really pretty much for the purposes of demonstration, I'm knocking off a little bit of an anterior osteophyte. I don't have, I don't, you don't have to do that even if it impinges, everything at the back is so tight, it's not going to let it uh, pop out the back. So now this is the other uh, trick, unique thing about superpart, the in situ reduction. Uh, and some people criticize it for various reasons of taper corrosion and impaction or this and that. Um, so far, I've been pretty lucky, I haven't had a problem. But what you put in, just like the trials, you put in the head first. Once you put in the head, then you put in the stem. And then you traction the stem and line up the, the, the taper uh, into, the, into the head. So this is a metal head going in, in this particular video. Um, you give it a good wash, you try and suck all the, anything out of it. Uh, so there's no bony fragment, but it is wet. It's not wet. <coughs> like a corral type stem, uh, pro femur oil. You know, you're looking into the canal, so you tap it until you, it's down. Once it's down, give it a bit of wash. And then this is a hook that goes on top of the brooch. It's never onto the bone or anything. It's always on the implant. So you can see the top right. Pull, 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 pull. Internally rotate a little bit until it lines up. Okay, release traction and you're in, okay? So that's the in-situ reduction. Now the uh, design surgeons, uh, they probably got a bit of criticism from Ceram Tech or someone gave them a hard time. So they've also described the, the ex-situ reduction where you just relocate it like a posterior approach. You, you, you uh, put the head on, tap it and then relocate it. But for that, obviously you have to release a bit more of the internal uh, external rotators. Um, which obviously has implications. Um, and then you repair the capsule, then you let go of the self retainers and hopefully you'll be able to see the intact rotators. And there's my piriformis. This is my routine trial for every patient. Uh, obviously not at the time of the implant, this is at the time of the trial reduction. We make sure that this construct is not dislocated on the table. And if it is, then we need to modify implant position or whatever we need to do uh, to get that. So this is the external rotators are stopping us from internally rotating any further. So you, you basically come across a lot of resistance. It's a shock inflection, mid flexion and uh, extension um, to um, make sure that the tension is adequate. Usually you allow a little bit of shocking in mid flexion because both anterior and posterior ligaments are um, slightly lax. 
but uh, in extension and flexion, uh, you shouldn't have any, any shock. So that's what we up to. That's the technique. Um, now, uh, with a few boring slides, then a few videos. Pros and cons. Uh, well, uh, I, I think I, I found it to be a very safe uh, technique. I've had 12 revisions now in a thousand. And if you take out, if, if you really uh, look at the technique being the reason or surgical errors being the reason in those revisions, I would probably blame maybe two. Um, I've had an infection and a burnt out septic arthritis. I had preoperative infection. I had a cup loosening in uh, a, a AVM from um, radiation. Uh, I've had a couple of guys, one got hit by a car, one fell off in the storm, etc. So a few, few fractures, mainly fractures. Uh, a couple of them cup frac uh, cup uh, one cup debonding uh, so two cup debonding as a result of uh, uh, trauma years down the track so i've i've been uh, pretty lucky in that regard it's safe at the time of surgery because it combines minimally invasive principles without the benefit of the associate concern for increased risk profile because you get to see everything you need to see you're not committed you can release a bit more as you need to so there's no real need for the the learning curve it is reproduced. We've shown that many times over in, in plenty of studies. Uh, and it's familiar territory for the posterior approach surgeon. So, you know, most people in Australia are posterior approach users, uh, worldwide actually. And then having to go to the front and learning a completely different technique, it, it is a different technique. So it's not like someone, well, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so I'll do the anterior approach, even though I've never done it before and expect a good result. It's, it's not possible you know you have to have familiarity and this allows for that so for a posterior approach user this is this is the easier minimally mis technique you, you can learn because you know you, you're the positioning is the same the incision is the same just the top up and you can release more and make it a posterior approach um and so you learn at at your own pace and it's not implant specific you probably there's a whole variety of right medical implants that are available but you know if you, if you wanted to do something else i'm sure it, it can be doable. And the instrumentation as well, is, is nothing special. You, know, you don't have a complex traction table or this and that. It, they're just basically homens that have got certain angles and there's a cannula, that's it. Um, in terms of uh, functionally, you, you get absolute immediate stability. Uh, you, can have, you can have absolute stability on the table, which means you obviously don't need the hip precautions. The patients can bring their knee up to their chest and not of the operation. They can cross their legs. You don't need the abduction pillow. You don't need the raised toilet seat. You can let them sleep on their side. You can get into a low chair. They often go home the next day. They get into a car. Um, I haven't shown this by a study, but my opinion is that they certainly have less pain. I've certainly got a publication of mine which showed that by two weeks, most people will off any narcotic endones or any analgesia. Uh, but these people do complain of less pain. They're not. They're off medications usually by two weeks. And if and if they're not, you can you know who to blame. Um, yes, it's not it's not for the impatient surgeon. And we've got I've got quite a few friends that are like that. They want to just bang in the hip in half an hour. If you haven't done it before, you can't do it fast. And you, there are times when it takes two hours, two and a half hours. But most of the time, we get it done between one to one and a half hour closed. Usually, the implants are in by one hour, and then closure takes another 15, 20 minutes. Um, they, sometimes at last week, I had a 130 kilo, very tall, muscly man who had extremely large cyst, which had eroded into his pelvis. So the anterior half of his acetabulum was gone. And that took us nearly three hours. But that would be very rare. I mean, most of the times it's usually hour to hour and a half. Uh, the benefit obviously is, is preservation dependent. You know, if you're going to cut more, then you expect that that will have implications. So if, if someone's going to release the piriformis and the rotators to make it easy for themselves, well, that's great. But then you can't expect the same degree of stability as you would if you had them intact. Um, contraindications, I haven't really excluded anyone from doing superpath on them. The only one person I remember I could not even start on was someone who had a very severe, he had like a 30 degree abduction contracture and a deformed head. So I basically couldn't abduct him enough to visualize his uh, femoral, uh, the top of his femur or the you know, piriform fossa. And even the posterior approach took me three and a half hours. 
Uh, but other than that, I guess there's not really many uh, contraindications. Um, and uh, you know, is it is it is it the ants pants in hip replacement? Well, I don't know. I think hip replacement is generally is a winner operation, as long as it's done well, irrespective of whether it's microinvasive, minimally invasive, anterior, posterior, direct lateral, anterolateral. We all know hip replacement. As long as they're done well, will have a good result long term. Short term. Definitely, I think compared to my own posterior approaches and compared to a lot of my colleagues here, yeah, this is this will definitely be a couple of months ahead. Um, so when I'm telling other colleagues about taking it up, uh, obviously you don't want to compromise long-term results. You don't want to compromise a complication. Um, and for the younger guys, as Harry Callahan said, the man's got to know his limitations. Uh, I think. I think we already saw this video. So I'm gonna stop that one. This one. So here we're testing extension and extension or external rotation. This is again a stability check. You can see that the knee is touching the top of the drape over there. So he's got 130 degrees, like doing a deep squat. There. I've got my finger on the femoral head. He's got a lot of internal rotation. And we call this the yoga position. So, you know, we get the foot on the other thigh as if the person is doing a, like a chokery position. Uh, and we, we, test, we test everyone on the table. This is the mother of a, a person who sells implants other than themselves a different implant. Okay, so it's now about three o'clock. So what about four, three more hours up in your operation? Uh, yeah. Okay. Can you just pull your knee up? Grab hold of it. Hold yeah, pull it up as high as you can. Good. Comfortable enough? Okay. Can you I couldn't your... do that. Just okay. Put your right foot over your left thigh. So as if you're reaching for your shoes or doing your socks or around the center. Is that comfortable enough? By the way, is the sound from the video coming across? Yeah, a little cracky, but yeah, not very clearly. Okay, so it's about, yeah, this is about four hours post-op. Uh, so she she just said, I couldn't do this this morning. That's fine. That's fine. Come down. Right. So what we'll do now, you can just put your knee up and then you can just... This was about five years ago. I was using catheters. Now we don't use catheters. Anymore. So you see, they, they rise very easily because of the intact ITB. This man's about 150 kilos. Very large man. Can you pull your knee up? And then it's his stomach that's stopping his, his flexion there. So, now, the most exciting thing about this man was that his wife, Betty, went to school with Elvis Presley. <laughs> this man is, uh, had a BMI of 45. He had a cardiac condition and they wanted him to go to ICU post-op. This is him in recovery, waiting for his ICU bed. <laughs> this man is an ex-football player. So big, muscly, muscly gentleman. This is day one. How long is since you have replacement? Uh, one month. Yeah. So it was yesterday? Yesterday. Okay, can I just get you to stand up? And just come for a walk towards me. I'm just going to back up a little. Okay, and then if you just head that way. Oh, no, no run. No, no run. Can you stay close? Yeah. Can you stay close? Okay. 
Excellent. All right, and then have a seat. Maybe just turn the chair towards me a little bit. Okay. And then bring your operator leg. Yep, okay. Good. And as if you're doing your shoes. Now this man, uh, okay, sure. he, uh, he was three or four months post-op and uh, he came to see, because I normally see them two weeks, then six weeks, then a year down the track. So he came at four months saying he, he had fallen off his uh, push bike, his uh, bicycle. Um, he's fine, he hasn't hurt himself, but he wanted to know if it's okay to still do his exercises. So I asked him, what exercises are you doing? Can you show me? And then he showed me this. I don't know about him, but I was having tachycardia. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one, other side. Okay, that's good. All right. Now, excellent. Okay, and if you stand up, sir. What have you had done? <laughs> that's good. What have you had done? Yeah. With what technique? This man came to see me from Malaysia. So, uh, now I can get you to take a seat. Whenever uh, they come from interstate or overseas, we try to hold on to them for the, till the two week mark so that we can check their wound. Um, so that's two weeks. Hold on to it. I must admit, not all of them like are like that at an hour and a half, but when he said it, I thought I'd better keep this video. Pull it up as far as you can. Good. Okay, now cross your legs. Yeah, <laughs> now, I, I didn't, um, when uh, Bart told me about the video and he said, oh, I mean, told, told me about the presentation, he said, oh, uh, I'll send you the, the uh, ad for it. And it said, we let people do squats. Uh, uh, the next, you know, two weeks or something. And I thought, oh, we don't do that. Uh, I'm worried they might have a fracture. Um, but since the ad had already gone out, I had to find a video of a lady that I was making her do squats the next day. And uh, she's now about seven, seven years down the track, but that's her day one. Yeah. So this is the first one. <laughs> well, I don't like the time of day. That's two weeks. Two weeks. You're fantastic. And the usual crossing Beautiful. legs and that sort of That's stuff. That's fine. And this lady is in recovery, and there's a reason I'm showing you this video. That's about, you know, half an hour after she walked, you know, after she woke up, maybe. And uh, she's young, she's about 50 something. And about six, seven months later, she sent me a video of her competing in physical culture. And at that time, I didn't know what physical culture was, but it's, uh, it's really popular here amongst the middle-aged uh, ladies. Uh, it's a relatively low impact aerobic. That's her, yeah. Oh, that, that's pretty much it. I think, uh, you know, in terms of preservation, I think as long as 
uh, yeah, yeah, it's done well, any approach will have a good result. But yeah, preservation has its benefits. And if we can do it safely, uh, preserve as much as possible without compromising our view, without compromising our uh, technique, then uh, it can only be better. Um, I've, we've published uh, in Reconstructive Review, we published in the Journal of Anthroplasty, um, the, the Parth is, uh, sorry, yeah, Supreet is looking at publishing something else, uh, hopefully in the next couple of months. But um, what I want to show you, apart from, so this is where I live, apart from this is a couple of x-rays. And I think I've shown you videos, not just of the slim, easy patient, I've shown you some fairly big, large patients as well. Um, let's close that. Show you some common x-rays. And I have to say, I haven't updated it for a while, so it might not be complete. Oh, this gentleman, yeah, he didn't fit on the operating table. We had to use some extensions. This is the same guy. Okay, so here, pre-op on the top, it looks like he's had his other side done and I'm not sure what happened at that time, but it looks like they were struggling to get maintained length. So they had to really lower the neck cut. They had to really mesialize the, the cup. We got away with very, very cheaply here on the other side. Uh, with a primary stem. This lady has a fair bit of protrusio. There's a ilioistial uh, line. Um, and a lot of the times the post-op x-rays don't reflect the amount of stress and swearing that's involved in the operation. And this will be one example of it. Um, avascular necrosis, uh, DDH and avascular necrosis. What's wrong with this person? Oh, this is a little bit of petrosia, mild. This one's just got a lot of osteophytes and uh, contracture. Uh, this one was osteopetrosis. Uh, in AVN on a background of uh, perthase. This hip was almost ankylosed. Uh, again, Petruzio, uh, this one's got uh, slightly more uh, than again. She's a, than a short, very fat, short lady. Um, and you can see I've, I've got a good position for the cup, but with the stem even going below my left stroke, I still managed to lengthen her a little bit. Um, and that's just the limitation of the implant size that we had. We didn't really have a short neck. Uh, Perthes, this was a fairly large cyst in the acetabulum. We were able to graft it pretty comfortably. Uh, this gentleman had a fractured femoral neck in the past with a good three or four centimeters of shortening. Uh, and we were able to get him back to length. Had to medialize the cup though, otherwise it would have been impossible to do. Previous fracture, we've done a few of these now with previous femoral shaft fractures and each time we've been pretty lucky. Um, this lady was, uh, the canal was very small. You know, the size one, uh, stem uh, did not go down. It would have lengthened her like a couple of centimeters. So I cemented it in an exeter. Um, this is her in recovery. A couple of hours afterwards. Um, what's this? Yeah, this is DDH. Actually, this lady I did. This was in China, um, and they had a, only a modular and a, a different type of stem that I wasn't familiar with. But anyway, she did well. This is her in recovery. Come on. Uh, this lady had uh, CP and some contractures with a little bit of subluxation. I can see that she had other hip done uh, 10 years ago or something. And looks like, um, again, we got lucky here. Uh, they've got an SROM that I'm not sure whether they're fractured or whether they uh, did a shortening osteotomy, but uh, she's had some acetabular work done as well. Um, again, uh, we got away with a cemented exeter pretty comfortably here. Uh, this gentleman, I did his other hip uh, about uh, eight years ago. Uh, he's again, very stocky, 120, 30 kilo man, short, fat, very muscular. And I think this posterior approach took me two, three hours. I did this one with super part, took me an hour and a half. Uh, and the reason for that is because with the, especially with the muscly men, you know, you, um, you're often fighting the femur, you have to translate it anteriorly, you've got glute max insertion fighting it, you've got a big remus shaft, so you're trying to antivert it, etc. 
Whereas here, you haven't really cut anything and all the instruments are fairly um, slim. So you just flex the finger, allows you to antivert however much you need to. Um, and it's your, the soft tissue envelope dictates <clears throat> how much you can lengthen or, or, or lateralize. Get a mild EDH. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I have on my computer at the moment. Um, in terms of results, uh, I think we've, um, I've published the first 100 hips that I did. And uh, to give you a summary of it, uh, this was from the first one that I did uh, to the 100th one. Uh, no exclusions. We've got a wide variety of ASA scores, wide variety of um, um, uh, BMIs, uh, wide variety of age groups. And uh, we just did on basically everyone that walked in through the door. Uh, I had to exclude about, I think, 13 or 14 uh, because of various reasons. And I had converted three of them to a direct, uh, to, to a posterior approach after starting to the part. This was very early days in the first hundred. And we look for complications and we look for patient satisfaction and we look for functional uh, results. And essentially, we had three major complications. One guy got hit by a car, he broke his femur. So his stem was revised. Um, we had two implant migrations. One was a cup that went from being 60 degrees of uh, inclination to 80 degrees of inclination. But there was on the x-ray, the patient was pretty happy. She was very stable, so we left her. And she's now seven years down the track. She hasn't, hasn't been revised. It looks okay, so we left it. Um, and the third one, to be honest, I've forgotten what the third complication was. Um, in the first hundred, it'll come to me, but it didn't lead to a revision. Um, anyway, we've, we found that by two weeks, 86% of the patients were ambulant without any walking aids. 84% were able to dress themselves independently and over 90% did not need any opioid analgesia. So they all discharged on paracetamol, some anti-inflammatories for four or five days and um, endone PRN at that time. Now we use Palexia instead because it's tolerated a bit better. Um, out of the people that were working before the operation, we found 33% were back at functional baseline or work within one week of the hip replacement and half by two weeks. And patient satisfaction, uh, we assessed by uh, asking them whether they'd have the operation again or not, and whether they call it uh, excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor. And they all said very good or excellent. Um, one person said he will have an operation again, maybe. Everyone else said definitely. Um, but we, 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 we took that to mean a, a positive response. Um, and uh, the second study that we published soon after was a cohort of 100 consecutive patients again. Um, uh, and we looked at their break reaction time um, in terms of uh, how quickly they could put, take their foot off the accelerator and, and hit, the, hit the brakes if they had to stop. And the impetus for this study was that someone criticized me. They said, oh, your, your patients are driving early. You're telling patients to get back to, to, work, uh, to driving early. And that's illegal because people have done studies on this. So I thought, oh, I couldn't find any legal basis for it, but I found studies. So I thought I'll do a bigger study. And we did. And we looked at their bake reaction times immediately preoperatively and day one or day two. And we found they all got back to their equal to or better than their break reaction time by day one or day two. Uh, interestingly, soon after this study was published, um, the Orthopedic uh, Association had a position statement on driving after uh, replacement surgery and they changed their position statement to be in line with, uh, to be in line with the current literature. Um, that's pretty much it. I think uh, I've taken a lot of your time. Hopefully, everyone's still awake. Um, yep. <laughs> I think we might yep. uh, we might talk about it now. a bit more, a bit more interaction. Okay, I think yeah. we should now start the discussion. It was a very extensive and comprehensive coverage of the super path procedure, especially useful for people who are doing total lips very regularly and want to get into this. So, Dr. Sanjay, Dar, do you want to ask him a few questions? Yeah. First of all, thank you very much, Dr. Qureshi, for a um, fantastic approach and above, above all excellent results which you see. And if you probably know that 
Indian patients uh, squatting and sitting cross like this, something they always dream of. But we surgeons, in spite of doing a we avid posterior approach surgeons, we can't offer them that most of the time. But I'm sure this approach has shown us that you can do that. Well, I, I want to basically start where my, my uh, if I need somewhere hand holding is when you open the capsule, do you need smaller homans and all that to retract the capsule anteriorly posterior or you can use the regular ones? Hello? No, no. So the instrumentation um, is specific. So essentially, there's nothing special. They're basically L-shaped homans and they have blunt yeah. ones and sharp ones. So the blunt ones is what you use. Um, and uh, I'll see if I can find in the video that we played. Uh, the um, Bear with me one second. Um, and if, if, if you, if you consider like learning curve, I mean, yeah. why should we start? Like somebody, we here do most of the, most of us do posterior approach. So what is the next step yeah. to go to this uh, approach? I mean, why do I start? To me, um, uh, I, I have, think I have, attended, I have attended approach, minimally invasive approaches, but uh, honestly, I could never do that. Uh, whether it is my lack of skill or but uh, no, no, Doctor Sub. I think it's probably because you are. It's probably because you are a safe surgeon. That's why. Um, okay, so just to answer your first question, so they got Langenbachs are a little bit longer here. That's it, and then the homans that are used to get inside the joint. Uh, they they look like this. So so it's a, it's, a, it's a right angle. So you position them above and so below the neck. In front of and behind. Okay. If you're above and below, then you've got the rotators. You actually in and front, you... anterior and posterior. So the posterior one retracts the, all the rotators and the posterior capsule, and the anterior one retracts the anterior the, the no, minimus where, medius where and do you enter, maximus. Where do you enter the, uh, the rotators? Is it, is it the piriform is guiding you or? Yes. So anterior to the piriformis. So the the basically the 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 piriformis is like so, and the minimus and medius is like that. You retract them anteriorly and piriformis posteriorly. Then you're looking at the top of the capsule. Say, if you're, say, the left hip, you're looking at about one o'clock. Okay. You make an incision just like that. And that will expose the femoral neck. You don't want to go too far posterior because then obviously you're going into the iliostial ligament and then you'll, by definition, will have to cut the rotator. You're sort of anterior to it. That way you've yeah. got a nice band of posterior ligament and anterior ligament and you go in between them. And all um, along and you don't, you, you you don't, don't all along you don't rotate the hip. Sorry, go ahead. I said all along while doing No, no, this, you, you can move it around however you want. No, no, to get a good view of you your... You can, yeah, you can rotate. Okay. Uh, you normally have it in sort of mid flexion. That gives you a pretty good view. But you can rotate it within the constraints of what the rotators allow you to do. Um, okay. You know, you, you can't get it into any non-physiological position. It's always in a physiological, natural position because the, otherwise the capsule and the rotators don't allow you to internally rotate that much. And uh, how do you measure your calca? Means how much, do you have a good view of lesser trochanter with, through this approach or no? There is no view of the lesser trochanter. So all you okay. can see is the femoral canal straight end on. You're looking into the femoral canal. Um, and you can see the neck, obviously, uh, the medial part of the no, neck. So you broach. While, while making the neck cut, what is what do you use as the reference? The distance from the top of the uh, superior part of the neck and the brooch. Because okay. you know how far down the brooch is. And then you've checked with an II as well. So you already know where you are um, in terms of uh, where your stem so, is and how far down it is. So even now, in spite of doing 100 cases, do you use an IA? I've done a thousand now uh, and okay. I didn't use II regularly for the first five, six so hundred. Now, now you don't. But so after later that, I thought, you know, no, no, I, I do now. I didn't before. Okay, okay. <laughs> 
Okay. I, the, the reason was from the landmarks, I could easily identify where my stem was. Yeah. So if I templated that I was going to be a centimeter below the femoral neck, you know, the top of the femoral neck on my x-ray, I'll say, okay, I want to be a centimeter below that. That will give me a neck cut. That's a centimeter above the lesser stroke, blah, 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 blah. I can get there and I can confidently say I am where I've templated to be. What obviously mm. I can't tell is how tight is my distal purchase? Because okay. the stem can be in the desired position, but if it doesn't have good distal tight purchase, it may subside. Now in a posterior approach, you just go tap, 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 tap until you get a good tight fit. Uh, mm -hmm. Here, I, I, I'm a bit gentle, but at the same time, even though I've got, and, and th despite that, you know, as you know, with uncemented stem subsidence is, still remains a, a, a concern. So here, I want to know that I've got a nice tight fit that will reassure me that, well, it's got nowhere to go. It's already touching the cortex. And that's what the II helps me with. Because otherwise what happens is that, let's just say I've got a size five stem in, it's where I want it to be. And then when I'm putting the definitive uh, implant in, I'm thinking, oh, what if it subsides? Maybe I should put a plus head or something like that. But if I've got an II, it's already shown me you are where you're meant to be, but also it can't go anywhere because it's narrow and tight. Then I don't really worry about it. Okay. So it, I think, and it takes it takes literally a few minutes. It's always reassuring, and it's uh, definitely something to uh, comforting uh, to know that okay, the, the chances of this subsiding are pretty minimal. But you don't have to. And the times in the first first 500, I would use it if I wasn't really sure, you know, is it big, is it small, or how is my cup positioning, this and that. But most of the times I didn't. And how worried one should be about the abductor injury or something? No. Not at all. You retracted them out of the way. They're not in the way. So your yeah, abductors are, pretty much everything is uh, well protected. The thing that most people worry about is a sciatic nerve injury when you put this trocar in, um, but it's a blunt trocar. Um, and um, it's a thousand, we haven't had one yet. Um, I'm, I'm sure if I had a thousand posterior approaches just following the literature, I probably would have had 15 or so. How do you, how do you measure? So how do you confirm your offset, uh, vertical offset and horizontal? offset means how to confirm your length or interoperative do you use any tool or something like that Ops, uh, the offset of the femoral neck you mean yeah yes um no from the template so i have two sizes available to me i have a standard offset and high offset or increased offset so usually from the templating uh, i will start off with the cup um and then depending on what my femur looks like i will estimate it to be a high offset or a standard offset excuse me and um we insist that our x-rays are printed to 100 percent magnification um so uh that that usually gives me a pretty good indication however that's me that's my planning part ultimately i will increase or decrease offset depending on my soft tissue tension because if all the rotators are intact, the capsule is intact, it's not going to allow you to increase the offset because if you try a high offset neck, you won't be able to reduce it. You know, uh, supreth on the other side or part on the other side will be pulling and pulling and pulling and you won't be able to get it in. Um, so that's, that's the soft tissues often are a very good indicator of how good your soft tissue tension is. Are you, is your high offset too much or too little? By the same token, if you put in a certain implant and you think you've got the right size, but then, you know, they can shuck it very easily, both in flexion and extension, go, hang on, there's a problem here. This is too loose. I think we need to tighten it up. Um, so that is still my ultimate guide. But the reassuring thing is that in a posterior approach, because you've cut everything, you might increase the offset. And I've seen plenty of x-rays where offset on the operated side is double that of the other side. In this, it doesn't allow you to increase the offset too much or length too much because the soft tissues will make it hard for you to reduce that construct if it's too long. And your incision, does it, what is the actual extent of the incision? Is it from the trochanteric tip upwards or? Yeah, trochanteric tip in about uh, 70, 60 degrees of flexion, approximately about uh, six, six or seven centimeters. 
it's pretty small. But not that it matters. If you need to make it bigger, you make it bigger because it's just a skin incision that you're making bigger or smaller. The ITB is still unaffected because we don't go there. Thank you. No, no, thank you very Neeraj. much. Any other questions? Uh, I have a Bar question, Dr. Uh, what about the adductor tightness? If some of the patients have preoperative adductor tightness, what do you do? Uh, but to be honest, I haven't seen many with adductor tightness um because uh yeah. you'll see them intraoperative or preoperatively you might not be they might not have abduction so most people uh, have abduction it might be tight they usually have abduction um but i guess if at the end of your procedure you still feel like they're going into adduction you can always do an uh adductor tenotomy or something you know um, one, one thing I did notice in the posterior approaches before I started superpath I was always doing a capsulectomy or an anterior capsulotomy because I would yeah. test their stability into internal rotation and the capsule would sort of fold in anteriorly and impinge and pop it up posteriorly. So <laughs> I'd always cut, 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 take a big chunk so that it's not impinging. I haven't had to do that for a single case here. And I think the only explanation I have for that is that because everything is intact at the back, it actually doesn't allow the excursion, uh, even though there might be a big osteophyte anteriorly or big prominence of anterior wall or lax anterior capsule, it doesn't allow it to ex ex you know, enough, enough excursion. The posterior rotators don't allow enough ex excursion for that to be a problem. Um, so I don't, I don't release, I don't, I, yeah, sometimes I might knock off an anterior osteophyte just for fun, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very impressive degree of stability that you get. Um, and you see that straight away. So, I mean, you can imagine years down the track, it's, 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 it's scarred as well, it's even tighter. And uh, for a few of the hips that I've had to go back in to revise a cup or something like that, um, it's fantastic because it's like doing a primary posterior approach. Everything else at the back is fresh and intact. It's almost virgin tissue, or you see a bit of scar around the posterior margin of gluteus medius at the top of the capsule, but all the rotators are clean, which means you can easily see the nerve, you can push it out of the way, you don't have to spend time to dissect it out, you know. It's, um, it, it uh, makes, makes made, made it very, uh, I hope I don't have to do many more revisions, but uh, it, it certainly made, made them easier. <clears throat> One more question, Dr. Sol. Um, do you think that when you put the neck inside the uh, head, do you think there is a micro motion yeah. that's occurring at that point? Micromotion between the neck and the head. Yeah, that could cause a release of ions or something like that. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So this is the other thing that is controversial at the moment. You know, after the metal or metal debacle, people are talking about tranionosis. A lot of studies on tranionosis and 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 taper disease as a result of tranionosis. I don't know what the audience, uh, in terms of high volume hip surgeons, uh, think. But when you think about the, the hoo-ha about tranionosis, how many, how many hips do you actually revise for tranionosis? Not many, you revise many more for fractures no. and dislocations and, and you know? So it's almost, I, want, I don't wanna say academic because that will be ignorant and uh, naive of me. I'm sure there is a problem, but it's not as big a problem uh, in common practice as, as, uh, uh, as a lot of people think. Having said that, um, yes, the one criticism of this technique, which is undeniable, is that the tapers are wet which means that there's a slightly more corrosive environment compared to if they were dry. The other thing is that, yes, I do not tap the head on, which means that there may be a bit more micro motion than if I had tapped the head on. And both those things could lead to a higher degree of corrosion. But what difference did that extra bit of higher level of corrosion make over a 15, 20, 25 year old period? That I don't know. What I have done though, I have done some studies on this. Um, one has actually been accepted by HIP International recently, so it should come out in the next few months. I got some metal heads <coughs> um, and uh, I got some tapers from Microport and I divided them into four groups. Um, one group, I had a dry taper, dry head. And one group, I had a wet taper, wet head. Um, and Sorry, let me get this right. So tap, no tap, dry, wet. 
So there were the four groups. And I, the, the ones that were tapped, I put them on and I tapped them with a hammer like we tap it, you know, in a, in a total hit. And the non-tapped ones, I just put them on. Then with a, a machine, we cyclically loaded them to the same degree of compression. Uh, and I think it was 500 cycles from memory. So basically simulating weight bearing. And once they'd all been cyclically loaded, we did a pull off test to see how much force is required to pull these heads off. Interestingly, the wet tap had the highest pull off strength, but there was no statistically significant difference between any of those groups in the pull off. So that means that, you know, ultimately, if you think about it, uh, it doesn't matter how much you tap, your tap is not going to be as strong as the person weight bearing. And they, you know, they talk about 2,500 newtons, the ceramic recommendation, but really how many people tap it with that much force in real life? Your stem will end up in the knee if you do that. Most people just go tap, 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 whatever music you want to make out of it. And the tapping we do in real life is nowhere near as much as the recommendation. And if you stick to the recommendation of the amount of force required to tap, you'll probably cause more complications than an unsymmetric stem. So from that, I concluded that perhaps you don't need to tap because tapping, uh, I mean, you can if you want to, but my, I didn't, I could justify not tapping it in my practice because pull off didn't make any difference. Um, yes, perhaps if you engage that taper by a harder pull off, just a little more, couple more treads, perhaps you'll have less micro motion, perhaps you'll have less uh, corrosion. Um, but I'd rather wear the corrosion than a calcar fracture because the corrosion will happen in 10, 15 years. The calcar fracture will happen now. Um, that was one thing. Uh, the second thing was deep down, I was still a little bit paranoid. I was using crowbar chrome heads. So I thought I'll stuff this, let's switch to ceramic heads. So from case number 300 something, I switched to ceramic heads and I always use ceramic heads. Um, it's a titanium taper. Um, what, what could happen? Uh, I guess you could get titanium uh, metallosis, which is not as bad as cobalt chrome disease. Um, I could get a taper fracture or something, although that would be very unlucky. Uh, but yes, I, I suspect there is a higher risk of taper disease, but my stability is, as you can see, and my functional results, short-term functional results, as you can see, my complication profile in regards to fractures and uh, sciatic nerve injuries and aseptic loosening, et cetera, is pretty low. So I think it's a calculated risk. I hope, I hope it's not different to any, any other way of doing it. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience who are watching us on Ortho TV. Can you take that now? Please. Yeah. So, Dr. Qureshi, do you template preoperatively in any and any special precautions and modifications in approach? Uh, for the templating, uh, no, I template every hip. Uh, the main uh, precaution we take is that we want to make sure that the uh, preoperative x ray, the AP pelvis centered at the symphysis and the lateral of the hip, is true magnification or 100%, so that you know, we've got a close idea of where, where it is. Um, and then on top of that, to doubly check, uh, I get an II shot as soon as I put the femoral brooch in before I make the neck cut. They're the two things I do. Okay. Do you need any special jigs for acetabulum reaming? Jigs? No. It's just the reamer, the, the cup, the, the reamer, uh, they have reamer baskets are standard. They just got a hex head uh, hole on top of them. And the reamer driver, um, the shaft uh, is narrow. So it comes in through the cannula and it engages into the reamer. You see the reaming directly through the main incision, but the shaft and the reamer driver go in through the cannula to meet up with the reamer basket. Okay. How do you apply your cup screws? Sorry, sorry, Neera, just to add on that. Sorry. The benefit of that is that you're not fighting with a big fat reamer shaft. You're not fighting with the femur. Um, so we can get very antiverted if we want to or retroverted because it's slim and you know it, 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 it's occupying less space so it allows us a lot more uh, dynamic amount of uh, space to uh, uh, adjust our version. Screws, um, it's like a, a you, you, you go through the cannula, you put a drill guide, the drill guide just sits into the hole that you want to drill and you put the drill through that. Um, the, drill, the drill bit has uh, markings on it, so it's very, very quick and very easy. it's much easier than posterior quick, much, much easier. Uh, which incision do you use to put the screws, the superpath incision or the reamer incision? 
the portal because it's good. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. The portal, yeah. You take the, the drill out, then you put the screwdriver and the screw on it through the thing and it goes straight into the hole. Okay. So these are all audio, uh, these are all uh, audio have, related questions. Uh, have you ever done your study comparison with direct anterior approach? No, Gaurav, very hard to do because every time I've approached someone to do it, they've uh, not been very, um, <laughs> they've not wanted to do it. <laughs> Um, and uh, actually one of my good friends was that direct anterior and he said, yeah, let's do it. But you know, we have to standardize everything. Um, I said, what does that mean? Well, that means all my patients will get a PCA, they'll get a catheter, they'll have the standard hip precautions and the other ones, you know, said, well, what's, what's the point of that? I'm, you know, patients come to me for a super part, so I'm not gonna uh, slow them down for the purposes of a study. So that's why I'm stuck to just presenting my series rather than a comparative analysis. But okay. if anyone there wants to do it, I'll be very, I'll be very keen, you know, please get in touch with me. In India, very few people do anterior approach. Do anterior. Yeah, very few. You can count it on the fingers. So less. Yeah. Uh, it's so a great technique. As long as it's done well, it's, it's got good results. Uh, so, you know, uh, but uh, it, I mean, uh, my, uh, with Superpad, the, the thing that I found beneficial was the immediate stability and yes, quick functional recovery. And I can, I'm sure you can achieve that with anterior as well. Um, but um, you just have to do it well. I know, I know of surgeons here that uh, routinely book smart cables every time they do a direct anterior approach. Now that, that's a bit concerning. Uh, expecting a femoral fracture when they do it and, and booking smart cables as part of the setup. You know? uh, that's, yeah, you don't want that. You want to be comfortable. Okay, Parth, do you have any more queries? No, thank you. Thank okay. you so much. Yes. Sir, Sanjay Dar, sir, you have any more queries for him? No, it's okay. <laughs> okay. So we thank uh, we thank Dr. Saul Qureshi uh, for spending a good afternoon with us in India and maybe a good evening for you. It is. So, yeah. And we thank our viewers thank from TV. We thank Dr. Thank Sanjay you. Dar and Dr. Gaurav Kanade and Dr. Parth Agarwal to be a part of this. Thank, thank you and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Qureshi. Thank you, Dr. Qureshi.